Good day, everyone. Welcome again to day three of the Truth and Reconciliation Week programming. I'm Brenda Gunn, the academic and research director here at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. I'm Red River Métis, currently located on Treaty One territory and the homeland of the Red River Métis. Winnipeg is also home to many Indigenous peoples, including many Inuit. I'm really excited to be joined here today by Duncan McHugh. Duncan is a longtime CBC reporter, radio host, and investigative journalist. He has won Canada's top prizes in investigative journalism and was part of the team awarded the Hillman for CBC's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women series. He's a Anishinaabe and a member of Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation in Southern Ontario. He's joining me here today to share some of his thoughts and ask, answer questions about the Cooper Island podcast. And so for the educators, just a reminder, you can place your questions in the chat box on Hublot and I'll pose them to Duncan. Hi, Duncan, how are you today? Ani, Brenda, Ani Kenawea, Onkwadans, Indigenous Kas, Bainvan Neto Dem. Chippewas of Georgina Island and Dunfa, Nishnabe and Dao, and Kitchenendam, Ayaya, Mampi, Nongo. It's good to, to see you, Brenda, and see everybody. Um, and, and I just introduced myself in uh, Nishnabemwen uh, and gave my name and my clan and the community that I'm from, which is our traditional greeting where I'm from here in, in Ontario. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll give the teachers some time to get their questions into the chat box and maybe I'll start by asking a few questions, turning the tables as it were, having putting me on the hot seat. Yes, exciting, exciting times for me here. Um, you know, I think we have lots that we're going to talk about with Cooper Island podcast, but maybe we can start with um, if I could ask you a little bit about your history and your education, in part because I think many of our students that are joining us today might have an interest in journalism and would probably be really interested to hear how you got to be where you are today. Yeah, I uh, uh, went, I always was a writer uh, when I was a teenager, when I was in high school, uh, I had a little journal that I used to write cool quotes down from songs and poems that I'd read and things in the newspaper that I thought were interesting. Uh, but I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, I didn't really have a clue. Uh, and and uh, I did know that I wanted to go to university, though. And so I went to the University of King's College in Halifax. Uh, I'm from Ontario, but I went out to the East Coast to go to university. And the first couple of weeks that I was at university, uh, there was a table, all the signups for all the groups and clubs and everything like that. And there was one group that was uh, the student newspaper. And they were looking for people to write for the newspaper. And uh, they, man I, they managed to convince me to, to sign up. And, um, and so the fir very first article that I wrote um, for the student newspaper at, at King's College was about racism at the school. Uh, so being Nishnabe, uh, I was very aware and noticeable that a lot of the student body was white um, a lot of the, all the profs were white uh, the administration most of the administration um, and I thought that the you know indigenous students and other visible minority students should have better access to university than what I was seeing so I wrote an article about that uh, about systemic racism uh, that was keeping Indigenous students and, and Black students and, and people of color out of the classrooms. Um, and it had a really big impact uh, at the school. Uh, there were students sitting around reading it, the administration read it, uh, a group of students <clears throat> started a, a, a petition that they uh, to, to get the president of the university to recognize that there was systemic racism there and that they needed to change. And so I went, wow, this media, uh, it, it, there's a lot of power uh, in that. And, um, and so that's what got me started. Uh, I just kept on working for the student newspaper at university. And then lo and behold, uh, three or four years later, I did end up going to law school, but, but three or four years later, I ended up working for the CBC. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, that's a great journey and absolutely important to remember the power of media. And maybe that's where we can turn now is, is talking a little bit about the Cooper Island podcast. Um, the students have had uh, some, one of the episodes from the podcast shared, but do you want to maybe introduce the podcast just a little bit more in case students haven't had a chance to watch that episode of our programming yet? Yeah, so the, the Cooper Island podcast is an eight-part series uh, about one school uh, on, on the west coast of Canada. Uh, a, a, it's uh, a small community uh, now called Penelicut. Uh, which is on an island uh, in the Salish Sea. And the Cooper Island Residential School operated on that island for uh, nearly 100 years. Uh, it started in 1890 and it closed in 1975. And hundreds and hundreds of uh, Hokaminam students uh, or, or Salish uh, uh, children were, were sent to, to the Cooper Island School. Um, the podcast, uh, we follow uh, the journeys of, of four children that, that attended the school uh, in the late 1950s and, and, uh, and 1960s. Um, three of them survived the school. One of them didn't. Uh, one of them died at the school. And uh, the reason, Brenda, that we, we wanted to do this podcast was, you know, you're wearing your orange t-shirt. Last summer, there were so many Canadians who, uh, decided to, to start wearing orange t-shirts to mark the, um, the unmarked graves of, of children who died at residential school. We wanted to try to share with our listeners uh, that this was about more than numbers. Um, that we, we remember all of those schools, uh, all the First Nations that were announcing that there were unmarked graves uh, on the former grounds of residential schools and the numbers just kept adding up and adding up. And we know that the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation has said that there were over 4,000 children that died at residential school, but those are just numbers. And we wanted to really help people understand that those were children. They were children that were taken away from their families and never made it home and, and try to explain the impact on the families. And, and so that's really what the podcast is about. Ah, oh, thanks for that background. So maybe we can get into the episode that we shared with the students a little bit more, and maybe you can tell us a bit more about why it was important to share Richard's story in particular. Yeah, so Richard's story, when, when we first went to the uh, to the community of Penelicut and, and met with the, the, the elders, uh, to, to ask permission for to, to do this podcast, um, they talked a lot about about uh, the, the graves that had been discovered already at um, Penelicut, and they talked about not knowing the stories of so many other children. Um, one of the children that they talked about was Richard Thomas, and uh, it was a boy who. Uh, it was widely known in the community, uh, was found uh, hanging in the, the school gym um, in uh, 1966. And uh, this had a real impact, not just on Richard's family, but, but on the whole community, because there were so many questions around what happened. How did he die? Uh, it was, and I'm not saying this is uh, too strong a word, uh, Brenda, it, it was a mystery to many people, and and it wasn't. It was painful to talk about, but people still wondered. Like 50 years later, people were still wondering what happened to Richard. Why? Why? How did he die? What happened? And and we heard that from a lot of people when we first arrived in Penelicut. And so we thought maybe this was a way that we could help give back um, by by looking more deeply into Richard's story and 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 helping people. Uh, understand who he was, uh, who he was as a boy, who he was as a son, as a as a brother, um, as a cousin, um, and and you know it was it was remarkable to start to learn more about uh, about this boy uh, and and uh, how much he was loved uh, by his family, and, and we discovered that he was a writer. We discovered that. He, um, you know, that he was a really gentle soul, that, that you know, that, that place, Cooper Island, like so many residential schools, could be really brutal 
um, but Richard uh, didn't participate in, in some of the, in that brutality and in fact uh, sheltered and helped some of the young boys uh, from some of the some of that. So it was great to start to hear more about this young boy and, and some of the hopes and dreams that he had rather than just the awful way that he died. Yeah, that's that's a really wonderful point. And I think, you know, as I as I reflect on um, what I was experiencing and thinking about when listening to the podcast, and even your answer now really reminded that, um, that the stories and experiences, yes, it was individual children who went to residential schools who experienced the abuses. But that the impacts are really felt really far broader than any individual. And so um, I, I'm wondering if maybe you can talk a little bit more about how we want to remember the individuals and the individual impacts, but also how residential schools are really impacting families and communities. and and. You know, I don't know if you want to talk about that uh, specifically in relation to the Cooper Island podcast and the episode the student, students listen to or, or more broadly. Yeah, so in the segment that we chose for, for everybody in the classrooms, uh, if you have an opportunity to listen to it, it's uh, about, uh, we, we start off meeting uh, John, uh, who uh, Richard would have been his uncle uh, had, he, had he lived. Um, and John was on the same journey that we were to find out more about Richard because, you know, it caused so much pain for uh, his, Richard's uh, family, his brothers and sisters at the time uh, of his passing that they found it very difficult to talk about. Uh, they would often, uh, you know, self-medicate uh, to try to drown out their sorrows when they, when, when thoughts of Richard came up. Um, and, uh, and so John didn't know very much about Richard uh, because it only came up if there were family members who were drinking, for example, to try to, to put away some of those awful memories. Um, and so he wanted to learn more about Richard, but didn't know where to turn, didn't want to raise causes. His mom, for example, Richard's sister, uh, pain by asking about, about Richard. Um, and so we start off uh, in, in that segment that we shared with you, we start off talking with John, you know, the fact that he never met him, uh, but, but learning more about how he passed away and some, of the, and some of the terrible things that happened at the residential school, it was a real shock to him. It was really, really upsetting uh, because this was his, his uncle that he'd never gotten to know. And, um, and, and there were so many, uh, so many, there was so much tragedy associated with that painful memories and and so i think the the point being that that yes john's mom belvy um who was richard's sister absolutely uh experienced a great deal of pain losing her brother and attending his funeral and and never really knowing what had fully happened to him uh, having questions all of these years but it extended down to 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 belvy's children uh you know this who had the same questions and didn't have answers. The, the, and the way I describe it in that segment is that it, it, the, the experiences, the deaths, uh, the abuses at residential school have ripple effects that go throughout generations. And, and it's really important to understand that, that this isn't you know, black and white ancient history. This is happening in the here and now. And, um, and so I think Richard's, Richard's story is, is, is an example of that. Yeah, I think that uh, that reminder and that learning for many of our students that this isn't history to many Indigenous families and peoples and communities. This is this is something that people continue to work through today. So I, I want to talk a little bit about um, dealing with all of the emotions that must come up. And, you know, I can only imagine as a journalist, as an Anishinaabe man and working on uh, the Cooper Island podcast and the other work you do, 
but this must really impact you. How do you, how do you deal with those impacts? Um, I, I, I became, I chose to become a journalist for a reason, Brenda. Um, you know, I, I believe in the calling of journalism that, that you know, the, the, the goal, the thing we aspire to as journalists is to share the truth, to expose the truth, to shine light in dark places. Um, we go places um, when we're doing our job to the best of the, our abilities, we go places that other people might not want to go because we believe that sharing these stories will, will help all of our, our country. So, so I, I believe in that, uh, you know, that, that journalists have a role and a responsibility to, to, to talk about difficult things sometimes. That's, that's part, part and parcel with what we do. Um, that's not always easy, as, uh, as, as you say, as an Anishinaabe Nene, as a, as a man, uh, you know, talking about the tragedies and the traumas that our communities have experienced, not just residential school, but, but you know, the, the substance abuse uh, or missing and murdered Indigenous women uh, or the sexual abuse, these, these are all very difficult topics to, to, to speak with people about. Um, I learned the hard way, Brenda, that I need to take care of myself when I'm doing that, that and, and the term has come up as, as self-care. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 you can feel as if you are, are um, you know, you have a cause uh, to, to share that truth with the, with the rest of the country. And, and that is a weight and a responsibility. And if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't sleep well, if you don't eat well, if you, if you don't uh, let some of this trauma go, because hearing those, just hearing those, those stories, I may be a reporter, but those stories are coming to me, into my ears, and then coming out through me again. And so I am you know, experiencing what they call vicarious trauma in many ways. So, so it's not my trauma, but I'm experiencing someone else's trauma just by hearing their stories. Um, I need to, to make sure that I let some of that go and, 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 uh, and don't carry it with me in a way that, that you know, doesn't allow me to experience joy, that, doesn't, that, that I make sure that I spend time with my family, uh, that, that I'm, I'm a good father, I'm a good partner, uh, all of these things. Um, and, and I, I, but I have learned that the hard way. It's, it's, it, it hasn't always been easy. You, you care so deeply about these stories and want so badly to, to make sure that you do do them justice, uh, that, that can be difficult uh, sometimes to, to, to let a story go. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really, I think, good. In there is also really good advice to our students who I think are hopefully being really uh, empowered through the programming we're offering this week to um, not just learning the history. And I want to come along as the conversation goes to what can the students go, but we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, and one of them is whether or not you've visited the residential school sites and what was that experience like? Oh, I, I've been to, to many residential schools uh, across the country in my, in my reporting journey. Um, it's different in, in, in all, in, in, at, at many different schools, you know, um, I can think uh, the first time I went to the residential school at Alert Bay, which is a, a small island, another small island off of uh, off the coast of British Columbia. Um, I was struck by this big, monstrous uh, red brick building that had been uh, painted white, and the white paint was peeling off of it. It was old, and you know the the community had. Many communities uh, kept their, the, the residential schools because they, they didn't have enough buildings. Uh, you know, they needed those, those buildings to, to have the band office in, so their First Nation government. Uh, in Alert Bay, there were lots of artists that were using the old residential school building. And I was incredibly struck by the fact that, that here, you know, in this place that was all about assimilation, it had been reclaimed by the community. And the artists were now, you know, generating their incredible uh, masks and uh, and artwork in in the basement of that building. 
It's since been torn down, by the way. Uh, they, they knocked it down a few years ago. The community decided they didn't want it around anymore. Um, I have been to the Mohawk uh, Industrial School in Southern Ontario, uh, which the community has said, we want to keep this place standing and we're inviting people to come here for tours so that they can see its evidence, its proof of this history. And, and the Mohawk community of Six Nations has fought very hard to try to keep that school open and, and funded uh, in a way that, that lots of students uh, and adults as well can, can understand some of that history in a real visceral way. I've been to other uh, communities uh, like the Mission School, for example, in, near Chilliwack, where you wouldn't even know that the school existed anymore. There's, there's, there's hard, it's, it's an empty field um, and, and there's very little uh, that exists to even um, to, to mark that it was there other than, than some uh, cement blocks that, that once were the foundation of the school. And, and so some communities uh, wanted their, their schools, they wanted to erase the, the, the whole experience from, from their memories and the landscape and they tore them down. Other communities have uh, kept the buildings standing and are now using them. There's communities that, that have turned residential schools into uh, schools, but you know, uh, there are others that have turned them into hotels or resorts. So it really depends community by community um, what, what, they, what they decide to do. Yeah, yeah, that that variety, right? That not all residential schools looked the same in community responses to residential schools and the process of moving forward and healing. I, very I will say, Brenda, though, to, to the student's question, I've always felt a little creepy going to a residential school. Like, you know, there's there's a lot of, uh, you can feel uh, the, uh, the weight uh, of, of a place um, often. And so, uh, in in the, the beginning of the Cooper Island podcast, we talked to an elder who talked about the fact that there, in, in Penelicut, there were people who, after they tore the school down, um, you know, that they could sense that there were children's spirits who were reaching out to them. And I've heard that over and over again, at, at, at not just at, at Cooper Island, but other schools, that people feel the weight of spirits when they go to these places. Uh, and I have felt that too. Uh, I don't. I don't know if creepy is the right word, uh, but you certainly, um, you know, you feel the weight of the spirits in in some of these places. Yeah, definitely. I I, I agree with that sentiment. That's been my experience as well. Um, another question has come in. I want to acknowledge we had a question come in about. Um, challenges of being indigenous person in the workplace and i'm going to kind of i want to come back to that uh um maybe later on in our q a session um but a, a question came in that says that uh you grew up in southern ontario but we read that you also lived in a creek community when you're a young boy can you talk about that experience and and maybe you could uh share a little bit about uh your your book and and some of your experiences there yeah, if, if it's, if it's a, uh, some Cree folks who are, who are asking that question, watch ya, watch ya, uh, hello. Um, I, uh, when, when I was a young uh, teenager, to, uh, 11 or so, uh, my parents uh, moved from Southern Ontario, uh, Peterborough, the town of Peterborough, where, where I grew up, um, to Northern Quebec, uh, a little small community called Chisassabi, which is on the, the shores of James Bay. And I was a, a, an Anishinaabe kid uh, who grew up in you know small town or or uh, uh, in southern Ontario, and then all of a sudden I was going to school in this little tiny Indian reserve up north in, in James Bay, where everybody spoke Cree as their first language, and all the kids grew up hunting and trapping, um, and it was a culture shock for me, uh, you know, to be more or less an urban kid and then going up to, to, to Chisassabi, um, it wasn't easy, I'll tell you. Uh, you know, I, it was a, a real tough period for me. It's never easy when kids, when you move, when you, you leave your friends behind and you go to a new place. But there was this other weird element of culture shock that happened to me. I was native, but the kids were calling me uh, which means white man, because I didn't speak Cree. Um, and so uh, 
I, I, that was tough that first year, but I'm also so grateful and thankful to uh, the EU, uh, the, the Cree people. Uh, we lived in James Bay for five years. Um, I did spend lots of time uh, learning how to hunt, uh, learning how to trap. I'm a terrible hunter. I'm a terrible trapper. Uh, but but I learned some a thing or two uh, from the Cree people, and and I consider uh, uh, you know th there are families in Chisasabi who I consider very much to be my family as well. Even though I'm in the I, I have these this Cree family uh, who who. Um, you know, it's 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 a real blessing. The the teachings that I learned from 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 living up there. Excellent. Well, thank you for answering that question. Um, I I want to come to something that I was thinking about in one of your responses to an earlier question of mine, related to the role of media and uh, different mediums in sharing history about residential schools, because. One of the things we've talked about at the NCTR sometimes is the idea that we always want to remember when we're asking survivors to speak and reaching out to survivors that it can be um, triggering or can bring out some trauma when we ask survivors to tell the stories. But we also have heard from intergenerational survivors, so people whose family members went, that it can also be somewhat traumatizing to have not heard those stories growing up. And so when I think about um, things like the Cooper Island podcast, I think about that really important role in how media can sort of share these stories and educate. And I don't know if you have more you want to um, speak to on, on that of sort of the role of media in in sharing some of this education so i understand brenda when when our indigenous communities get upset with reporters who show up and stick their microphones in people's faces and ask you know questions about residential school and then take the stories away and, and put them on the news i totally understand that when when i started in this business 20 years ago Part of the reason I got into becoming a news reporter is I wanted to change some of that. Um, you know, this notion that reporters only show up when there's bad news and 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 they they take our stories away and they're in our faces. Um, I wanted to do things differently uh, because I understand the anger uh, and, and frustration with journalists that our communities feel, but I also I'm, I've, I've I've experienced this firsthand on more occasions than I can count, Brenda, that sharing a story can also be very healing it can it, the the process of just speaking your truth and sharing your story with someone can also be a part of the healing journey for a survivor not all survivors feel that way and i think that's the responsibility that we need to teach to journalists and students i'll tell you who are being asked on orange shirt day to perhaps go out and interview survivors you need to tread really carefully and really respectfully about talking with people who may have experienced trauma and 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 the impact that you ask just asking questions I, the questions may come from a good place don't get me wrong but you may be asking questions that may hurt and and we all have that you know we all know what that's like when someone asks you something that you feel uncomfortable talking about whether you know, it, it could be about your family or about your sexuality or, or you know, there, there are all kinds of things that, that people have a diff, tough time talking about. But put yourself in the shoes of those survivors and imagine what it's like when you ask a relatively simple question like, what was the food like at residential school? Um, and so as a journalist, I think it's our responsibility to make sure that as best as possible that we take care when we ask those questions, we make sure that there's someone there to support uh, the survivors uh, after we've, we've um, you know, listened and heard respectfully. Because the truth is, is that I, I don't live in Penelicate. I, I don't even live in BC. I live in Ontario and Toronto. Uh, and I was going, to, I was there to ask questions and tell a story, but I was going to leave. And, and so and I'm not a therapist and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a mental health counselor. And so 
I wanted to make sure that I wasn't hurting anybody more than they'd already been hurt. And, and that meant being, you know, human and, and listening and, and showing, taking care and making sure that I was there to answer their questions afterwards and keeping up the relationship. I'm, I'm still in touch with, with all of the people on the podcast uh, and, and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, to, to keep up that relationship with them. Oh, thank you. Uh, such a thoughtful and important response. Um, I want to come back to the podcast a little bit. Um, and I'm hoping you can maybe unpack something that happened uh, near the end of this segment. I think you're speaking with Richard's nephew, John, and you ask about National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And I think John, he sounds very frustrated, maybe, is the, the emotion that we're hearing about, you know, and, and I feel like I almost visualized him throwing his arms up in the air about, you know, there's so much injustice and so much unknown. What is a day, you know, going to do? And do you have any thoughts or reflections on that? Or, or maybe from your own perspective, the role of National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? I, I think that different people, different indigenous people have different reactions to the, to the day. Um, and that's fair. Um, you know, not, not all indigenous people uh, share the same opinion about everything. And in fact, uh, you get a hundred uh, indigenous people in a room and you'll probably get a hundred different opinions. Uh, so, um, you know, that's fine. As far as John goes, John, you know, because he, there was so uh so much that he didn't know about his own family's history. I think he was extremely frustrated uh, that, you know, that Canadians would, would feel like wearing an orange shirt is all that needs to happen. That, that if, if, you know, I think John felt like justice, uh, his, what his, uh, conception of justice meant uh, was had, had wasn't being wasn't being answered yet by Canada and and the answer that he gave was that he wanted to see uh, people punished for the kinds of abuses that they they delivered uh, at, at residential school um, but you know he understood that that Canadians were trying to express some form of, of solidarity with orange shirts and by wearing orange shirts, but he felt that there needed to be much more. Um, so I, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for John, but but I think that's I, I'm trying to to give some more context to to why he shared what he did. As far as my own thoughts, I like to think about it uh, as Remembrance Day. I mean, I think there's a reason why the Truth and Reconciliation Commission called for a National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. I think of it like Remembrance Day. Um, we wear poppies, you know, on Remembrance Day and remember the veterans who died in war. Um, and, and, you know, not just World War I and World War II, but more recent wars as well. For example, the war in Ukraine that's happening right now. Um, but it's about more than, than remembering those soldiers that died. It's about trying to understand the atrocities of war today trying to prevent war from, from hurting nations and, and families uh, around the world. That's what Remembrance Day is about. And in much the same way, I think that yes, we should be remembering the children that passed away at residential schools on the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, but we have to be remembering the indigenous children today and, and understanding that my ancestors when they signed the treaty uh, here in Southern Ontario um, with the newcomers, with the settlers, that they believed that we would have an equal relationship, that we were going to share the land in a way that would be a partnership and a relationship. And over the course of a hundred years of history, the scales of power got, got very, very uneven. Um, and, and um, you know, it's, to me, the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation is about making sure that we live up to what our ancestors um, committed to, 
in the treaty relationship, which is making sure that the youth of today, indigenous youth of today, and Anishinaabe youth of today have opportunities, opportunities to express their culture, opportunities to participate in the economy, get jobs, you know, uh, all those kinds of things. And, and, and that to me uh, is, is, yes, it's, I love it when I see all the orange shirts. I marched in Toronto last year on, on Canada Day and there were thousands of people marching down Dundas Street wearing orange shirts. And I just thought, this is beautiful. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to express solidarity, but it's gotta be more than just wearing an orange shirt. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for that important reminder, even you know, when we're talking about National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, we also want to balance and keep in mind that truth part, right? Sometimes we heard that at the NCTR from the survivors we work with, right? That lots of people are really motivated right now to contribute to reconciliation and they want to get involved. But we're still in that process in Canada of understanding the truth, right? And I think what you've highlighted here in your converse, in our conversation and in the podcast as well is that it's not just truth and reconciliation. There's healing, there's justice, there's lots to this. So um, yeah, I think that's really uh, a, a really important uh, point that you've shared with us. But let's maybe talk about reconciliation a bit. We have a lot of youth joining us who over the course of this week have learned about uh, or learning about or more about the history and legacy of residential schools. And it's not an easy history as, as the podcast really um, demonstrates, you know, it, it's tough. And so what are do you have any ideas or advice or suggestions for our youth today on how they can really contribute to reconciliation in Canada? I love that you're sitting here listening to me and, and I hope I'm not boring you to death. That's I think it's great that we're talking about these things in school because uh, as as former commissioner of, of the, the TRC, uh, uh, Marie Sinclair has said, you know, it was school that got us into this mess and it's school that's going to get us out of it. It's education that's going to help us uh, understand this part of our history. But, you know, what, what can I do uh, is a great question. Uh, and and if, if, you're, if you're thinking that, you know, here I am saying it's got to be more than an orange shirt. Well, I take the opportunity on, on September 30th to educate yourself. And I think that's, that's the, I, I'm happy that, that, that teachers are doing that in the classroom. But you know what, there are easy ways that you can do it at home as well. And uh, there are, for example, um, go follow uh, five Indigenous TikTokers uh, or five Indigenous Instagrammers or five Indigenous journalists on Twitter. You know, whatever your social media, uh, you know, tick, I know you all your kids are on TikTok and I'm not, I'm not too old. I'm, I got gray hair. I'm too old for TikTok. I can't, can't deal. I like some of those dance moves though. But, uh, but you know, if, if you get in your little, your little social media bubble and you only follow your friends, but if you want to really understand what your, your indigenous neighbors uh, are, are talking about and the movies they're watching and the things that they think are cool, then just follow five indigenous uh, folks on your social media feed. Um, and if you Google indigenous TikTok or indigenous in Instagram, you'll come up with all kinds of really cool people that are into fashion or, or uh, books books. Uh, I love, you know, supporting Indigenous authors. And there are so many uh, Indigenous authors who have written really, really amazing books about residential school. Uh, one of my favorites is, is Richard Wagamese, who wrote this great book called Indian Horse. I'm a hockey player. I love hockey. I've talked to survivors who played hockey at residential school. And Richard Wagamese does this beautiful job in Indian Horse of, of talking about uh, uh, about hockey at residential school. That's just one example, but there are so, again, Google indigenous authors and residential school, and you'll see lists and lists of, uh, you know, 40 uh, books that you could read at all age levels, whether you got a little brother and sister at home that wants to learn about residential schools, like why are you wearing your orange shirt? Um, you know, there are kids books that you could read to them. They're five or six years old even. Um, 
uh, David Robertson when we were young, also a really beautiful, beautiful uh, child's story. So I'm a big fan of book clubs, going to your public library, getting some of those books uh, and, and learning a little bit more about residential schools, not just in a boring old classroom, but in, in you know, cool books that you can take home and, and read on your own. Another thing, music, you know, if you're on uh, if whatever your music streaming is, Spotify for me, uh, but you know, maybe you listen to CBC Music. CBC Music has a, a great stream um, uh, of, of indigenous musicians on CBC Music. And I know we have a show called Reclaimed uh, where on September 30th, they're gonna be just playing uh, music to honor survivors and, um, and, and all kinds of indigenous musicians have written songs about residential schools. One of the, my favorites is Digging Roots, which is a, uh, a band here in Ontario. And they sing this just incredible song called Cut My Hair, which is about you know the children that went to school and had to get their hair cut. Their long, beautiful braids were cut off. And they just sing an amazing, amazing, like cool jazz, uh, not jazz, but, but like rock, rock, uh, blues kind of song about about called cut my hair but there's so many indigenous musicians who have sung uh, songs about residential schools there's another uh, again cbc has a special coming up on september 30th uh, with buffy saint marie one of my heroes oh my god um and uh and and that's a way that you can learn a little bit more about indigenous people and residential schools um, in a way, there are movies, there, uh, you know, there's a movie coming out, Bones of Crows, which I really highly recommend. I saw it at the film festival. Uh, so there's lots of, of ways that you can educate yourself um, and learn a little bit more about our past, but also more importantly about our just incredibly vibrant future uh, that, that, that Indigenous people have in this country. Thanks, Duncan. Those were great ideas and, and great prompts to, to help the students to think about where to learn more. Um, I We're just about out of time, unfortunately. I'm loving this conversation so much, but I do want to ask the question that was put in uh, to our chat about being an Indigenous person. Um, do you think that's given you, have you experienced any um, uh, additional challenges in the workplace or has that impacted you in the workplace in any way and do you have any examples i yeah i have a uh, sadly brenda um you know when i first started out in this business there weren't many indigenous journalists and so i have a long experience of being the only indigenous person in the room at work um and that's never an easy place to be it, it's it's always a challenge being the only and i bet there are students around uh listening to us right now who feel that uh maybe they're the only lgbtq person in the room or maybe they're the only disabled person uh in the room maybe they're the only girl in the dressing room or the only um you know uh whatever uh, who, so i'm sure you know what i'm what I'm talking about when I say that that's an e a, a, can be a lonely place. It's even lonelier when you try to speak up and say, this is who I am, and I'm not going to change who I am to fit into the workplace uh, that you expect from me. Uh, I, that, that I want to, to excel. I want to be the best journalist that I can be, but that doesn't mean changing or sacrificing who I am. That can be lonely and hard too. And there have been ups and downs for me in that journey. Here's the good news, Brenda. Like maybe it was lonely 25 years ago when I was starting out, but now there are so many indigenous journalists at the CBC. Uh, we need more. Uh, we, there's always room for more. We don't have enough, but there's more and more young indigenous journalists coming up, not just at the CBC, but uh, APTN and other media outlets as well. And and that is a wonderful feeling to, to have your, your, your colleagues around you sharing ideas and, and their stories and laughter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I love that. And, and so that's starting to change. It hasn't always been easy. You got to fight sometimes. You got to stand up for what you believe in. But, um, and some people leave uh, it's, it's, it, it, and move on. And if you do that, that's okay too. You know what? Follow your heart. Be, be, remember where you come from and follow your heart. And and um, and and that's that's I guess the most important lesson I could share with you. 
Thanks. Yeah. And it reminds me that it's also a great role for our allies to play, right? So if there is only, you know, one Indigenous person or all the examples you provided, that allies can stand with that person and, you know, speak up in moments where discrimination is maybe happening and, and support the, um, support people who may be feeling isolated because they're the only ones. Again, great actions we can take. I think we're out of time. I want to thank you so much, Duncan, for mm. coming and sharing with us today. I want to thank all the classrooms for joining us today and engaging in this learning process. I want to remind you that tomorrow we have our live um, youth empowerment event that's in Mississauga. And for those of you who aren't attending in person, you can join the stream. It's at 10 a.m. Eastern uh, Daylight Time. You can watch it from our Hubelo site. It's going to be an opportunity to hear from survivors and see performances from Indigenous artists and really provides us a time and a moment to continue to remember the children who didn't make it home from residential schools and the families and communities that continue to be impacted by residential schools. So again, thank you, Duncan, for joining us. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'll peek in a way. See you later, everybody.